All right. So no questions. Ready to roll? Jump into new stuff. No lingering leftovers on the whole man and woman stuff. All right. Good. Oh, okay. Put it that way. Josh. It's interesting. I was just thinking about how if, if we lose, well, if the family gets broken down in society, then it's a whole lot harder to, to understand uh, metaphors like uh, the church being the bride of Christ. That among, yes, there's, that's exactly the case. That's very true. I would agree. That, um, see, that's part of what I'm getting at. And I'm saying there's, there's a little more at stake here than just, you know, oh, my goodness, we don't want women into our club, you know. And, and you get this kind of a, where people assume that you're just kind of being um, some kind of a, you know, macho, chauvinist pig, and all you're trying to do is preserve your space. And there's, just, there's so, so much more than that. And it's just so much more going on. And that's, and that's quite right. And so that's part of it. Yeah, it's, the metaphors all start to break down and, and, you, and things start to limp like crazy. I'd agree. Okay, good. That's quite right. Adam. I have a question that will take us back a few weeks. But, oh, oh, that's fine. That's what we're here for. So I was thinking about this yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. With distributing communion and even instituting it, we've talked about how vicars should not because they're not rightly called. Uh, uh, for somebody who's in a congregational setting where they've they didn't have a pastor. They said, you should be our pastor, and he's in training to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. They view him like a pastor. They yeah. treat him like a pastor, but he's not yet ordained. Yeah. Um, would we still say he should not? He should be yeah, those are those kinds of, you know, funny situations like, con you know, convertible vicarages, you know, and we send the guys out, and I know all the time this stuff goes on. My, my concern is always, okay, yeah, we all get it. Okay, okay, we got to get it. But what about AC-14? It's just one of those things where, you know, AC-14 just kind of just sticks there. And what are you going to do with that? And you can kind of take a slack view and say, well, it just kind of means when it's convenient. Or jump, by and large, we shouldn't just messing around. And we're not really messing around. That, that you can maybe make a better case there. You know, we're not really messing around when we got a guy who's in process. And that's part of the whole idea of, with Vicar, as far as I'm concerned, too. A Vicar preaches because he's in the process. He's under the supervision. He's, he, we're getting there. Um, but then the, the question starts to become, when do you have to have a, when's there a, com we have to have the Lord's Supper. Now, wait, you know, yeah, it's a great, awesome, cool thing, but when does it become an emergency that you have to violate the ordinary order? And that's part of the issue. And that's where I think the church hasn't, you know, taken the time to deal with that, I don't think, sufficiently. We just kind of do stuff and say, well, we're gonna, we have to. Well, in the story, let's think this through. Do we have to? What's going on here? Are we honoring the, the confession or not? And that's where I'm coming from. Is that Okay. Yep. About, about going in the church. Uh -huh. So you were taking these ripple effects to a, it's a bad idea for a woman to serve as president. And yeah, yeah. Well, that's not things. a ripple effect. That's just kind of. But anyway. It, it, extensions thereof. Application anyway. of the truth. Okay. That okay. works. All right. It's, it sounds like you're deriving something that's kind of a far-fetched idea, but I don't think it's far-fetched at all. But anyway, go ahead. So would these applications constitute sin? Well, or just... Oh, so is it a sin or is it just coming not cool? Yeah. 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 Because, you know, <laughs> sin, sin, sin. You know, this always bugs me. Um, and I'm not just getting after you, James. I'll just get after everybody in general. We ask, like, was it a sin? <sighs> How are we going to define sin? Yeah, okay. So if we take sin as any deviation from God's will, is it a sin? Yes. yes. And just be done with it. I mean, come on. So uh, most of what we do is probably sin. <laughs> What's the big deal? We get so worked up over this. But is it a sin, Pastor? And this is one of these standard things. Here's a piece of advice to you. When you have someone in your congregation, you're going to get this all the time in a parish, as a parish pastor. Pastor, is it a sin if... Just say, yes. <laughs> I don't even need to hear your question. Yes. So don't let him finish the question. Yeah, don't even let him finish. If you have to ask, it's a sin. I was going to say if I love my wife. Well, if you're doing it from selfish motives, yes, it is. And if you're doing it because of the glory you get from it, or because it's really just twisted lust, it's a sin. You see, I'll get you any way you want to go. And that's the way it is. It's the beauty of being a Lutheran. You can just nail anybody with the law. You just work around eventually, gotcha. You know, oh, you're right. Oh, I'm done. Because, you see, we are, we are duplicitous individuals. 
shot through with sin. Everything we do is shot through with sin. It's just the way it is. So what's the big deal here? Now, in another sense, yeah, sin's horrendous. And we should be avoiding and fleeing it. But on the other hand, what's the big deal about getting pinned down with the sin? Well, it's like we're a bunch of pietists running around that think, well, I can't sin today because if I did, I might have to repent. Yeah, well, then just do it. Sin and repent. That's the whole point. You know, I'll be a real sinner. That's what Luther's getting at. We don't need fake sinners because then you get fake gospel. Come on, come clean. So is it a sin? Yes. Can you sit in the vote, sin in the voting booth? Yes. Repent when you walk out. Yes. Can you sin by not voting? Yes. I just heard something recently saying, oh, it's not a sin not to vote. That's your freedom in Christ. Spare me. That's just rank antinomian junk. What is that? Of course you can sin by not voting because that's your responsibility. If you're shirking your responsibility, are you doing what God wants you to do? No. So when you shirk your responsibility, you're violating God's will. If you're violating God's will, what do we call that? Sin. Done. Hey, man. You should not wear clothes ever. So, it's pretty simple. What? We should not wear clothes. <laughs> no. God put clothes on Adam and Eve. Post fall, you should wear clothes. <laughs> <sighs> Nudist colonies are an aberration. They're wrong. They're wrong. Ah, oh, man. <clears throat> Andy. Um, can you speak to the role and function of elders and how that is properly a, a, a group of people who should be men rather than women? I, I ask this because in my limited experience, <clears throat> the role of an elder has been much more of a help and support role mm -hmm. which would fit women. Correct. Uh, so, yeah. can you talk about that a little? Traditionally, the reason this has been is because elder, as defined in the LCMS, has often meant kind of direct responsibility to the pastor and even oversight to some extent. In other words, when there's a problem in false doctrine, where do you go? You go to tell your elder. And I think the pastors did some false doctrine Sunday. Who's going to handle that? That's what the elders are for. So that's kind of why it's always been limited, because of that sense of that oversight. And you also have the idea that in a pinch, if this pastor comes up sick on Saturday night, who's going to read the sermon? Well, the head elder would. You know? So that's kind of, that's sort of where it comes from. And that's the main reason why. Now, in a lot of congregations where elders are primarily doing like, um, hey, I'm here to encourage you and find out how things go in your life. What's going on? Make phone calls, you know. Hey, you haven't been in church for a few weeks. What's, doing, what's going on? Fill me in. Oh, okay, you're just kind of getting sick of stuff. All right. Then she tells the pastor. I don't have a problem with that. But, you know, that's where you start working on different terminology, you know. And that's where terminology gets weirdness on this kind of stuff. You know, well, elder, deacon, and well, that's just made up words. Just call him a pastoral helper or something. I don't care. Whatever. Okay? All right. What's the, uh, what is our understanding of uh, the office that Lydia was in in the New Testament? Lydia. Yeah, see, Lydia is a gifted woman using her gifts for the sake of the church. And so the question is, what exactly is she doing? And that's where you start looking into what she's doing. So do women have a high priority, a high um, you know, profile in the church? No doubt. No doubt. And Paul valued them highly. They have gifts to use. And the point is, she needs to use her gifts within God's order. And I would say there's nothing in the New Testament that would make us think other than that. You know, that she's doing that. You have a bigger challenge with someone like uh, Priscilla and Aquila, where Priscilla gets first billing. There's discussion about why that would be. But you also have, they're the ones teaching Apollos. And it seems to be a team teacher, even maybe Priscilla doing the bulk of the teaching. So that creates some interesting thoughts too. You know, what role do you play? And can you do that kind of stuff? But I would say even that can happen within this overarching structure of the orders of creation without saying, hey, that's all been thrown out. Because look, we've got, you know, new things going on now. Not necessarily. We've got people using their gifts within the order. That's what I would say is going on. All right. And that's kind of the overarching thing, using your gifts within the order. And that's the big deal here, of course. And I, put, I talked about that last time, the whole significance of this idea of the, the toxis, this idea of an order, and better, maybe, like I said, arrangement or design. And that's really what we're getting at here, that there's a design, there's a structure, there's a plan, okay? And what's kind of cool is how this even fits into the idea of the oikonomia, you know, God's plan, you know, the big plan, that there's a structure, there's a plan, there's an order for this whole thing. And God is a God of order. St. Paul says it point blank. So when we arrive at the eschaton, it's not an anarchy free-for-all nihilism. 
I mean, that would be absurd. There's no, that's not a restoration. That's not paradise. The, the, when we arrive at the eschaton, it's everything in place under God's rule. And there is a place for everything. God's rule is there. So there will certainly be a toxis at the, at the eschaton. And, you know, will it be reflective of what we're living now? I suspect to some extent that's the continuity of how God tends to do things. And yet the fulfillment is often quite surprising in things we couldn't have anticipated in view of what we're dealing with now. It's like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. But now that I see it, I see the complete continuity. That's awesome. But who could have guessed? That's kind of how God does stuff. So that's kind of how, how I tend to look at this. And so what we are needing to do more than anything, that's what I'm trying to drive at continually here, is rethink how we understand this. And we've got to retrain our minds on this because we're so Americanized and so Westernized that we immediately think restrictive, you know, stifling, enslaving, binding me. And, oh no, I can't be myself. My autonomy is being threatened and challenged. And we push against this stuff all the time. It's just how we do it automatically. We don't even have to tell us. We just do it. And to retrain our minds to think of this as being a good thing. And I, it, you can retrain your minds. It takes a while, but you kind of get into this and you start to realize, you know, this is a good thing. Living in this is a good thing. And this is God's will. This is cool. And you begin to rethink how you define things like freedom and liberty and the whole nine yards. And just pay attention this weekend when you start hearing all your Reformation sermons. People start talking about the freedom we have as Lutheran Christians. And hear what they mean by that. Pay attention. What's that? Free to be faithful. Yeah, free to be faithful. And that's another class. So listen to hear what you hear. We'll get to there eventually, J.D., in here too. So listen to what the themes are. What's, how, are, how, are how is the word being defined? Are people honoring this? Or do they somehow see freedom meaning, yeah, we don't have to mess with that anymore. And that's often what goes on. Now, how is this relevant to the discussion of Richard Hayes? Very I would agree, exceedingly relevant. So there's actually some direction to where we're going here because the whole argument he's making, I would contend, is premised on this. That's really the crux of the whole thing. And he as much as says so because where does he hang his argument? What he says is the single most important section of all the scriptures for this, his whole argument. Romans 1, that's exactly right. And what's Romans 1 all about? Romans 1 is all about we're without excuse because everybody knows the way it's supposed to be. Everybody has a sense of what God's will is. Everybody knows God's law because the law is just this. It's the whole built-inness of God's will, and we could even call it natural law, and Hayes hints at this as well, even though he's somewhat reluctant to dive into that mess because of natural law being so convoluted in so many different discussions nowadays. All right. Now, we'll come back to this in a minute. So let's back up. So, what would you think of this essay by Hayes? I found uh, more amazing this when it was written. I mean, it's like 25 years old. How come? <coughs> I know. I mean, I, I, I've just recently started hearing people speak like this, which I find to be really good. I um, agree. And okay. where's he been for 25 years? Well, There's my teaching, question. Teaching at Duke. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so you liked it. Anybody else? Yep. I liked it, the comment that he made early on about how his friend who was struggling with homosexuality took great offense to, the, to all of the people saying that they're finding their identity in their sexuality instead mm -hmm. of in God and therefore setting up themselves as idolaters. Yes, so there's one, one of many very profound insights in this essay and well-articulated insights. Okay, good. Anybody else? Positive or negative? Caleb. I thought his, the very end of it was one of the strongest things I've ever heard said about this. Okay. I would agree. Okay. I would quite agree. It is very good. Nicholas. It also gave me, an, especially the end, gave me a new view on the whole issue of church discipline. discipline. Of what? Church discipline. So. Uh, I'm missing your word again. Say it. Discipline. Oh, church discipline. Okay, sorry, okay. And um, my, my American ears. Because we normally we normally normally it came to church discipline when we have uh, homosexuality but no nowhere else. So mm -hmm. they all always feel kind of this issue, but nobody else and th therefore they feel dis 
this current day. Oh yeah, right. And right. So it is not this issue mostly, but more our understanding of church discipline, which can um, help us to deal with it. All right. Agreed. Good. Good. Yeah, Adam. I just thought it was such a compassionate way to write about a difficult subject to say, look, you're not excluded, you're not unwelcome, you're not undesired. Yeah. We actually have something better for you. All right. Okay, good. Now, what do you know about this guy, Richard Hayes? Professor at Duke. Mark, he's a Pauline scholar. He's a Pauline guy. He's te- What's that? I goes in scripture. Yes. Yeah. He's, and he's written a book, New Testament Ethics. He's written several books. He's a New T guy. He's an exegete. And he's a new T exegete is what he is. He's new T theology. Teaching at Duke now. Before that, he was out in California somewhere, I think. Um, so Hayes is um, he's a good scholar. And he's, he's a very, I mean, his new T ethics is a good text. He's a good scholar. He, he's got credentials. He knows what he's talking about. He's highly respected in the academy. That's who he is. So he's not a slouch, okay? And he's at Duke Divinity School now. So that's who he is. Um, this essay, in my opinion, is one of the single best essays on this topic I've ever run across, which is why I signed it to you guys. I mean, in a scant, what, 10 pages, he covers just bang. He doesn't mess around. He doesn't get sidetracked. He just cuts to it, and it's well written. The, the rhetorical ter, uh, for, tour de force of this essay is phenomenal. I mean, it's just in a classic example of awesome rhetoric. Now, what do I mean by that? We haven't talked about that in here yet, but I'm a huge fan of rhetoric, as you should all be. And we hear the word rhetoric now, and in 2016, people have taken rhetoric and they use it as a nasty word. Rhetoric just means twisting truth and lying and obfuscating, and it's what politicians do. It's just don't give me your rhetoric. But rhetoric is what? It's the power of persuasion. It's what it is. Melanchthon was a professor of rhetoric at Wittenberg. It's what he did. It was his forte. He wrote a book on it. In fact, it was the textbook used throughout um, the continent for a hundred years by everybody, including Catholics. He, it was that good. So Melanchthon knew rhetoric, and you see his influences all over Chemnitz. When you're reading Two Natures of Christ, it's all over the place. When you're reading The Form of Concord, it's all over the place. I mean, he taught his students well. They knew they were good rhetoricians. You guys should be good rhetoricians. Because when you get in the pulpit and preach, what are you doing? It's rhetoric. You are trying to present a compelling case, and you want your hearers to come alongside and be with you, right? That's the point. So that's good rhetoric. This is awesome rhetoric. I mean, you think about this, because he brings you along, you get to him, you put it down, and you say, wow, that was a good argument. He's, I'm with him on this. That's, that's, the, that's the mark of good rhetoric. And he makes several really sh- sharp moves along here. The best move he makes of all is where he starts with the entire essay. Because here we have an essay on homosexuality. Oh my goodness, here it comes. And what's fascinating is, this is included in a volume called um, Ethics After McIntyre or something like that. After Virtue, yeah. Virtue, Ethics After McIntyre or something like that. And it's written in the wake of McIntyre's After Virtue, which was in 1981. And it's kind of in that same spirit of things. And so it's written a little bit early on. But they have all these different essays, all these contributors, and then they come to this topic. And it's fascinating, because this is the only essay in the whole book where the editors step in and say, um, we need to say a little bit about this next essay. Um, in fact, this is such a highly charged topic, we've gotten two contributors representing two different sides of this issue. And we apologize for those who are going to be offended by what the first essay says, but it's one man's point of view, so here you go. And they're falling over themselves to apologize because this is going to be... Oh, highly confrontational and volatile. And then the next essay that follows is doing the standard, well, these are people from Christ died. It's okay. We've got to change our mind. We've got to get up the contemporary mores of the culture. And it's time to rethink how we handle homosexuals. The standard liberal junk you get all the time. That's their next essay. But this one's in there. But they're falling over themselves to apologize for it. And so you're all set up. When you're reading the book, oh, here it comes. Hayes is just going to go full blast, man. He's going to unload. And where's he start? That home and good friend. Yeah. His good friend, Gary. Good friend who comes to make peace before he dies. And they hang out and they spend the week. And they're friends. And you don't, you hear, is Hayes judgmental towards his friend, Gary? Not in the least. Is he judgmental towards the homosexual community? Not in the least. He talks about others he has interactions with and he deals with. So there's, is he a homophobe? 
Not in this furthest stretch of the imagination. And so you see, what he does is he just dismantles about 95% of the argument right off the bat. Because typically when people go after this position, they're, it's usually ad hominem arguments. You're a homophobe, you're self-righteous, you're hypocritical, you're not willing to, you know, bang, 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 bang. They don't ever get to the actual issue, is it a sin? No, heaven forbid we talk about that. They just get right down to what's wrong with you, why can't you receive me and accept me? And so he just cuts through all that by anticipating and say, look, I accept you. And here's the proof. And he doesn't, he's not that heavy handed about it. He just tells the story. Just tells the story. And of course, it suits his purpose because he and his friend Gary were actually going to write an essay on this same topic. But the guy dies. And she, you guys don't remember what it was like when the whole AIDS thing was coming out and all that. And it was a different world then. And so this is even more courageous essay for the time because he's coming out with, hey, he was my friend. And at the time, it's like, whoa, that's really crazy. You know, nowadays, everybody thinks you have to have a gay friend and it's cool. When he wrote this, it wasn't yet. So this is, it was a courageous position on his part, but he does it. Okay? And he does it without pulling any punches. And that's what's phenomenal about this. So there's something to be learned here just from the, from the um, rhetoric side of this thing. Okay? Now, the key thing then is you get into this, you get the whole idea. Let's just flip through this. It's so short, we'll crank through this thing. So page 206, second paragraph, he makes a, the comment. Gary was angry at the self-affirming gay Christian groups because he regarded his own situation as more complex and tragic than their stance could acknowledge. And this is what Tim already pointed out. He also worried that the gay subculture encouraged homosexual believers to draw their identity from their sexuality and away from God. Thus, it was idolatry. This is exactly right. And so many of the voices in the homosexual community, it's all about their sexuality, their sexuality, their sexuality. And it's, that's my identity. And it's not. And he makes another comment in here somewhere about, we almost act like it's a divine right for me to have sex. You know, that somehow I have to. And the idea of being celibate is somehow a horrible, you know, death sentence. That's actually toward the end of this. I remember he talks about that too. And that's just absurd thinking. It shows the idolatry our culture has on this whole area of sexuality and also the idolatry of I'll define my identity. That's the biggest rub in this whole thing, you see. Because all of this is premising the idea of a heteronymous law. And this is the big deal here that you need to get. The heteronymous law, which means a law from outside. An other law. Heteronymous, okay? An other law. And the con contrast of this, of course, is the autonomous idea of the contemporary world in which we live. That I am an autonomous individual. And take apart autonomous from the Greek, what do you have? Self-law. I'm my own boss. My own judge of determining reality. I pick my reality. I determine my reality. So it's all self-chosen. And if you want a living, breathing, walking example of this, you just look at Bruce Caitlyn Jenner. I mean, it's just in spades. This is exactly what you've got going on. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. I will choose to be who I really am because it's who I really am and I'm going to do it and that's where it is. And now in 2016 or a few years ago, we are all obligated by the fact that we're Americans living in this culture, we are all obligated to play along with Bruce's little game and say, oh, you're really Caitlin. Okay, cool. We'll take pictures of you. We'll give you awards and we'll celebrate how brave you are. And we'll think you're the greatest thing going because you're so brave. And so we're celebrating his, her autonomy. See, that's what it's going on here. And we're all forced to play along because anybody says, no, you're a dude who's all screwed up. Whoa, you can't do that. You just violated this poor person's autonomy and you're imposing something on them. So the whole premise of Christianity, the whole premise of Hayes' article is, this is real. You don't get to decide. It's not your choice. You don't pick your gender. God did. He gave you an X or a Y or a couple of X's. That's the end of it. Done. You just come to terms with it. And it's not a choice. It's not a malleable thing. It's not a variable. It's a given. And the whole idea of yielding to a given, submitting to a given, that's the rub. And that's exactly where the rub was last time, too. See, that's what holds this whole thing together. Are we actually submissive to an inherent, eternal design that God has built into the creation and built into each of us as he puts us in the creation? Or are we autonomous individuals 
thrown into the world who now get to forge our way in an existentialist tour de force and decide what we want to be because we're in charge. Which one is it? You can't have it both ways. You just can't. And the clash of those cultures is what we're living every day, guys. It's exactly what we're living. The whole abortion debate, it's not a complicated thing. It's real simple. Is the woman autonomous? She gets to choose what she does with her body? Or isn't she? We say, she's not. And the world says, that's nuts. Of course she is. No, what's there more? How can we talk? There's nothing more to even discuss. It's just a simple parting of the fundamental beliefs of what's, how things are operating. That's what's at stake here. You guys tracking with that? Making sense? All right. So that's where this whole thing is going. So we go to page 207 then. About five lines down. However much he wanted to believe that the Bible did not condemn homosexuality, he would not violate his own stubborn intellectual integrity by pretending to find their arguments persuasive. So in other words, Gary couldn't go along with all the, well, you know, the Bible really says it's okay. And the only thing that's condemned actually is aberrant homosexual behavior or not monogamous homo you know and you have heard the arguments and if you haven't you will so steal yourself guys you're going to get blasted with this stuff and you've you've got to be ready because this topic i guarantee you just like the last times this one you will absolutely face and very quickly absolutely and you might be faced just by having a parent of a child who has come out and now you've got to deal with that or you might have a situation where you have somebody who walks into your church and they're a, a couple, a gay couple, and you gotta figure out, what am I gonna do with this? You are gonna be confronted with this. So you need to think it through now and figure out how you're gonna think about it, what you're, how you're gonna approach it, and what's at work. And the application, you can always be sensitive and kind and gentle, but the bottom line is gonna be the same every time. It's either this or it's not. And you've gotta figure it out. And it's gonna take guts, guys. It seriously is. All right, so we go on. I love how he tells this story. So you get to still on 207, second to last, two last paragraphs in that se last section. Tragically, Gary soon came, became too sick to carry out his intention. His last letter to me was an effort to get some of his thoughts on paper while he was still able to write. By May of 1990, he was dead. Beautiful writing. He didn't pass away. He didn't pass gag. He died. When you announce in church that a parishioner has died, do not say, passed away. Don't ever say, passed away. That's a stupid euphemism. What is that? Passed. I hate when well, so-and-so passed. Where did he pass to? He passed a stone or what? You know, got rid of the kidney stone. Cool. He passed it. Good. Come on. He died. Let's call it what it is. They're dead. Death is death. It's dead. It's nasty. It's hard. That's what we deal with as Christians. Hard realities. Resurrection, also hard reality. Pretty cool. Much better than passing away. All right. So this then is his attempt to try to address this question. So now he gets into it. And he starts looking at the stuff. And he's going to go right to the text, what we expect from an exegete. So he's being a good exegete. And he goes to the text. He starts in the Old Testament, as you would expect. But he doesn't get hung up there. He just says, here you have it. A couple points. Boom, boom, boom. Clear cut. So you get to page 208. Third, second to last full paragraph. The OT, however, makes no systematic distinction between ritual law and moral law. I agree with that. The same section of the Holiness Code also contains, for instance, prohibition of incest. Is that a purity law or moral law? Hmm. In each case, the church is faced with the task of discerning whether Israel's traditional norms remain in force for the new community of Jesus' followers. Huge issue in the whole of the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law is God's will for Israel. And every bit of it, even the moral codes and all the kosher stuff, is growing out of this basic order. Question for us then is, which parts of those are specific for Israel and which things are normative for all time? And the idea that this order is established and sexuality happens in this order, that's clear cut. So the rules in the Old Testament against homosexuality are not something, well, that was just Israel. It's a clear in sync with this, and that's proven when you get to the New T, especially when you get to Romans. And that's where we're heading next. So then we get to page 209, Romans 1. And I'm about two-thirds of the way down the page, maybe three-fourths. The most crucial text for Christian ethics concerning homosexuality remains Romans 1 because this is the only passage in the New T that places the condemnation of homosexual behavior in an explicitly theological context. Right. It's not just a list. Paul is famous for his lists of sins and just bang, 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 bang. And so he just throw it in. And, but this one, he's going after it. And this is fascinating. Um, my 
a symposium years ago. I was dumped, this topic got dumped on me, and I had to deal with this. And what is so interesting about Romans 1 is how Paul deals with this thing, because he's not being homophobic. What's the whole context of Romans? What's he trying to establish in the first one, first three chapters of Romans or so? What's he trying to establish? People moving from the law outside to law themselves. All right. People who are out of God's control, who are moving away from God's law into their own law. People who are sinners in need of justification, right? I mean, you think about Romans, big theme. Man is a sinner. God knows it. He sends Christ. So by the time you get to chapter 6, ah, wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. There you have it. That's the hinge of the whole first part of Romans. So the whole first part is man's a sinner. So what he's trying to establish is who's, who gets to get a buy on this? Maybe the non-Jews do because they don't have the law explicitly given to them. Nope, 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 no buy for the Gentiles. They know better because the law is written in their hearts. That's the Romans 2 thing. No one's without excuse or no one can claim a, a freebie on this. Everybody's caught. Everybody's condemned. Everybody. So then Paul's making his, his, his case. So then he thinks, okay, I want to bolster this, my rhetoric, with a little illustration. So he looks around contemporary Roman society in the first century and thinks, what would be a good example of man doing his own thing in violation of God's will? What is a good example of man telling God to just kind of lump it, thumb his nose at God, and tell God to take a leap? What's a good example of that? Did he have any shortage of possibilities? No. He had all kinds of possibilities. You had men being bad husbands. You had wives running around on their husbands. You had child exposure. You had the whole idea of you know, the, you know, exposing your child and getting rid of your infants, infanticide. You had the Colosseum starting to ramp up and all the bloodlust there. You've got Rome, you know, their thirst for territory. You've got no shortage of possible targets. So where does Paul settle? He settles on homosexuality. Oh, he's just hung up on this. No, because you see, this is such a classic, glaring example of man saying, yeah, I know how you put me together, God, and my body is kind of evidently made for another person of a different sex. It just kind of fits better that way. Most of us have noticed this. And yet, in spite of the obvious realities built into my own body, I'm going to say, I don't give a rip about what you want. I don't even care how you built me. I'm going to do what I want with my body and to heck with you. That's what's going on. And so you actually embody your rebellion against God's purposes. You just tell God, I know I'm a dude and I'm supposed to be with a dudette. I don't care. I don't care. And I'm going to force this issue, literally. And you start getting to all the graphicness of this and thinking, what's going on here? And you can't help but make all the associations. That's exactly what Paul wants you to do. He wants you to say, that's just not right. And you all know how this goes. What's the first experience a little kid has the first time you tell them what homosexuality actually, actually is? Yeah, they always have that same reaction. Nobody's like, oh, that's cool. So it's like, what, really? Yeah, let's talk about something else now. Because, you see, it's unnatural. It's the whole point. It's the whole point. All right, so we'll go to 210. It's the first full paragraph. The fundamental human sin is the refusal to honor God and give God thanks. Consequently, God's wrath takes the form of letting human idolatry run its own self-destructive course. So this is just the consequence. When man is let loose, this is where he goes. He just gets more and more depraved, more and more insistent on, I'll do what I want. Darn it. That's what you get. So then we go down a couple more paragraphs. Paul singles out homosexual intercourse for special attention because he regards it as providing a particularly graphic image of the way in which human fallenness distorts God's created order. God the Creator made man and woman for each other to cleave together to be fruitful and multiply. When human beings engage in homosexual activity, they enact an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual reality, the rejection of the Creator's design. They embody the spiritual condition of those who have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Wow, how about that? Hayes and I are on the same page. Must be right. Now, this is so well said, and he can even go further here, but he's being somewhat polite, because you think about the whole idea of the homosexual thing and what's going on, and you've got death 
all wrapped up in this, but the whole idea of, you know, expelling from your body what is unnecessary and what is corrupt, and yet that's the focus of all the attention in the homosexual stuff. It's just so graphic, as he puts it. That's the whole point. So you go from life and, you know, the wonderful creating new life to a dead end, literal, sterile, death invoking relationship. It's complete antithesis of one another. So there's nothing loving or wonderful and mutually embracing about it. It's just merely self-serving and corrupting because it's a violation of God's will. And it does not matter the motives or the feelings of the people involved. Irrelevant. All right, so his, this is his case, and he's made it. So now we go a couple of lines more down, and it's the whole idea of the exchange, and he talks about that nicely in the second, the last full paragraph then. The expression parafusin, contrary to nature, used here by Paul is the standard terminology in dozens of ancient texts for referring to homoerotic acts. The fact is that Paul treats all homosexual activity as prima facie evidence of humanity's tragic confusion and alienation from God the Creator. This is the whole point. So it's man just doing his own thing, alienated from how God wanted it to be. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Man's going to do his own thing. And the other thing that's important to recognize here as well, and we'll get into this a little bit more as we go along here, it's the action that is the problem. So in other words, if a person identifies homosexual feelings, that in itself is not an evil that he has to you know, repent necessarily. But you have to be careful here as well. But in other words, can a person say, I'm a homosexual because I'm not attracted to women, I am attracted to men, that's the reality, and yet I recognize this is a wrong thing, and I'm going to start to struggle with this thing, but I'm still a homosexual. There's no problem here with that. So this is exactly where he identified his friend Gary. So Gary is still in this thing, but Gary's trying to live a repentant life with all the implications that, that will come with that, which are not easy for him. But that's what he's going to do. And so it's the action that is the problem. So it's homosexual activity that is forbidden, not being a homosexual per se, depending on how we're going to define homosexual. So in other words, an inclination or a lack of desire for someone of the opposite sex is not the problem. The problem is acting on this and living the lifestyle, which is a violation of what God's purposes are. So if you have a guy who says, yeah, I don't feel like I'm attracted to women, you say, all right, we're going to do with this. Well, I, I, just, I guess I'm going to do it God's way. Then you stay celibate. You work on you know, correcting your, your thought life so it's not being a perverse thought life. You're not engaging in fantasies which are opposed to God's purposes. And together we'll seek God's will. And Hayes even makes the cardinal sin in here of suggesting that reparation therapy is legit. In other words, helping counsel somebody to actually turn from homosexuality and become a, a, a heterosexual with you know, regular relationships. He, he suggests, yes, definitely a possibility because we're new creatures in Christ. But nowadays, we all know that's completely ruled out. In fact, that's considered to be abuse. And it's, it's forbidden in all psychological journals now. To do that is, is abuse, and it's been outlawed in just about every state. You can't do it anymore. You can't do reparation therapy because now you're violating the autonomy of the individual, and you're imposing a worldview on them that you're, you're, you're violating their personal integrity. This is, this is where we are as a culture. But Hayes is writing enough ahead of time he could get away with that still and suggest that. But that's where we are. But as Christians, of course we believe that. And there are also Ill examples, quite a few of them you can, I can produce for you, of people who do change, do turn. And a lot of them have ministries. You've heard of some of them and can tell some remarkable stories. Yep, Adam. And even in states where it's outlawed, are pastors still allowed to do it? Or is it completely you can't tell someone to change? Um, a pastor is always able to say what he needs to say, but he has to realize that if somebody gets ticked off, he could find himself getting sued. I mean, that's just where we are as a culture. And the time will come, the culture is going to become less and less tolerant of that. You know, right now they still give you slack, but who knows how long. It's, I, I Probably the right answer to say, it depends on the state, check the laws of your state. That's the official line. <laughs> All right, so on the other hand, yeah, James. Um, I think... At, uh, I was in Virginia for my, or North Carolina for my vicarage, and we had our, our district convention. I think, uh, Aaron, you were there too. It was kind of an interesting discussion about um, this issue, and one pastor spoke to the issue personally because his wife came to him as a lesbian, mm -hmm. and they ended up, you know, he 
you, through counseling, I mean, he basically, Law Gospel did the whole, you know. Oh, he helped out. her. And he helped her to, and they, had, they got married. They were married. And, and they've had kids. I was and, guessing that. Okay. And she <laughs> tested, I mean, she tested. So at the <coughs> Congress, uh, Congregation Voters Assembly, she basically gave her testimony about this, oh. what happened. Oh. Pretty gutsy move. Yeah, that's that's cool. In front of a mm -hmm. room full of pastors. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, it was very cool. It was yeah. very cool. But, um, so, you know, but I think his his approach, uh, this pastor's approach was, you know, I engaged her in love, mm -hmm. in Christian love, and we, you know, I, I didn't make her change, but the Holy Spirit did what he did. So I, I proclaimed the word. That's, and that's our job. We just lay it out there and let the Holy Spirit do this thing. And this is, this is the big lesson, guys, and I've hit this before, I'll keep on hitting it again. I talked about in church discipline. When you decide you're not going to tell somebody the full brunt of God's law because you're trying to be nice, you're actually stinting the work of the Holy Spirit. You're making it impossible for him to do what he'd want to do because you're not giving him free reign. You just got to speak God's truth and let the Holy Spirit do what he will. And if it offends, it offends. If it converts, awesome. But you've got to give the Holy Spirit the ability to do that. And when you decide you know better than the Holy Spirit, oh, if I do that, it might offend them, therefore I won't, fine. You've just tied the Holy Spirit's wings, if you will. Really? You want to do that? Talk about quenching the Spirit. Um, at Timothy, we did a Bible study on homosexuality before I went on Vicarage. An eight weeks kind of session went through the Yarber, the Yarber book? The Yarber House. Yarber House. Yarber House book, thank you. Um, and, and that was also very interesting because we had, and it got brought up because of uh, a, a couple of families were wrestling with this. They had a, a son or daughter that came out and they were trying to figure out how do I, how do I be a parent to this, to my child right. whom I love. Right. And, you know, and that's one, of, again, what we talked about was, you know, you love the person you you, you have to you reach out. You're, you're always your child. You keep loving your child as your child, but you also speak God's truth to him. But one of the things we did talk about was, and I think this is another area that as pastors we got to recognize, don't pick this sin as the sin to talk about. Right. Because, you know, there are plenty of heterosexuals out there that do the same thing. Right. No, I, I agree. And that's well, one, but that's one of the problems. I, I agree. The church, the church looks hypocritical when we get all worked up about this, but we don't care about divorce or cohabitation. And if we're not going to address cohabitation, or we're not going to address unscriptural divorces, we don't have any right to talk about this. That's completely legit, and I agree with that 100%, which is why we have to get our act together and start dealing with what we need to deal with across the board instead of picking and choosing the ones that are socially, you know, big deals. Instead of just being consistent with, this is God's truth, let's live according to his order. Yeah. All right, good. So we go on. Page 211, and I'm going to move into the next part of this. Last full paragraph. Thus we must reject the apparently commonsensical assumption that only freely chosen acts are morally culpable. Quite the reverse. This is an awesome insight, true in a huge ethical way. The very nature of sin that is not freely chosen, we are in bondage to sin. I oh, sounds so Lutheran. But still accountable to God's righteous judgment of our actions. Exactly. This is classic Christian Lutheran theology. You're in bondage to sin. You don't have any choice. Well, then I shouldn't be held accountable. Wrong. <laughs> You're accountable for what you have no choice over. That's not fair. Right. Deal with it. That's the whole point of the bondage of the will. Right? I'm a sinner caught in sin. Well, then God can't damn me. Well, yes, he can. And he's going to. Because he's giving you a way out in Christ. But I can't choose Christ. That's right. But it doesn't matter. That's, this is what's going on here. You see, we can't become beholden to logic, logic says. And then you get this, and then that leads to the next point as well. We'll get there in a minute. In light of this, theological anthropology cannot be maintained that homosexuality is morally neutral because it is involuntary. Right, that's not the point. So then on page um, 212, he talks about the whole idea of healing, and we should take this seriously. We already covered that. Then he talks about the idea of the abstinence, and this is the um, point four on page 212. Demythologizing the idolatry of sex. The Bible undercuts our cultural obsession with sexual fulfillment. Despite the smooth illusions perpetrated by American mass culture, sexual gratification is not a sacred right. But you would think it is. I mean, that's why we have to give people birth control, because it's their right. You know, this is why this whole health stuff is such a big deal, because you can't deny somebody birth control because it's their right to be healthy, and that's part of their health. They have to have sex. And that's the assumption. And celibacy is not a fate worse than death. He's right. 
Scripture, along with many subsequent generations of faithful Christians, bears witness that lives of freedom, joy, and service are possible without sexual relations. Exactly. And see, this is where we start to have to be consistent. That's the whole thing on the cohabitation and premarital sex and all this kind of stuff. Why is it wrong? Because it's not God's plan. God's plan is that sexuality is a great gift, a wonderful thing that God gives us within the context of marriage. That's the arrangement. That's the order. And so, is it hard for a guy who's gay not to be able to act on his sexual feelings? Yes, it is. Is it hard for a guy who's straight, who's not married, not to act on his sexual feelings? Yes, it is. Many of you can give eloquent testimony to the struggle. I know it. We've lived through this stuff, okay? And so you get it. It's not easy being faithful. It's not easy using your body the way God wants you to use it. It's not easy. It's a drag a lot of the time. Now, a gay person has even greater drag because he doesn't see any end. He's going to have 80, 85 years of life, and he'll never get to fulfill that. Well, so there's a guy who never quite finds the right spouse. What's he supposed to do about that? Live the life God has given him to live. You don't get to pick and choose. Can you make the same analogy, you know, an alcoholic or a, you know, a drug user? Yes, I think because so. it's kind of the same. It seems to me it's kind it of does. the same. So I have a predisposition to this. So what? And that leads in nicely to a point I wanted to make that I don't think Hayes says, but I want to make this really clear because this has become now the new in vogue thing. Well, what if there's a gay gene? And what if God made me this way? Because if God made me this way, then what's natural is for me to fulfill what God made me to be. So if I have a gay gene, that's why I, how I have to be. And my response would be, I don't care if there's a gay gene or not. It does not change what God has said. God has laid this down. This is the arrangement. And if there is a gay gene discovered, the explanation is real simple. Oh yeah, we live in a broken world. And so even our DNA gets messed up. So what else is new? You mean God didn't make people with uh, birth defects? Exactly. You have genetic birth defects and you have all kinds of stuff. And in fact, God even says, did I not make, is it not I who made him deaf or blind? It's, yeah, it's my call. I, I did it, you deal with it, but you still live within God's purposes in spite of what you have. So you're an alcoholic by disposition. That's a drag. You know, yeah, you have to, it's going to make a difference for your life. And you're attracted to the same sex by disposition. All right. I don't care where it came from, whether it was upbringing or whether it's genetic. It really doesn't matter. You still are responsible to live within God's purposes. And God knew that when he created you. And he knew that he was going to give you a church to surround you to help you to be faithful. That's how we function as a Christian church. That's what we do together. All right. So that's good. Um, so can God use us? Yes exactly what's going on here. Um, this is the middle of 2.13 then. This is kind of where he says what I was just saying. I'm about four, line, four paragraphs down. Even if it could be shown that same-sex preference is somehow genetically programmed, that would not necessarily make homosexual behavior morally appropriate. Well, I'd say it absolutely would not. Surely Christian ethics does not want to hold that all inborn traits are good and desirable. Exactly. Just because you have it by nature doesn't mean it's a good thing. That's exactly the case. Then the very end of this, that last full paragraph, but the fact remains that there are numerous homosexual Christians, like my friend Gary, some of my ablest students at Yale, whose lives show signs of the presence of God, whose work and ministry is genuine and effective. They are evidence that God gives the Spirit to broken people and ministers of grace, even through us sinners, without thereby endorsing our sin. And so, what, how do you handle the gay person? You handle the way, the way you handle any other sinner. Your job is to live a life of repentance and live at the bottom of God's grace. That's what we do. So we re renounce the sin in us, we turn from the sin, and we keep on coming back to God, looking for His grace and His forgiveness. And that's how you counsel the homosexual to act. Can you have him as a friend? Yes. Can he be involved in your congregation? Yes. He can be a repentant sinner like everybody else is. So he is in no different category than the recovering alcoholic or the serial divorcee. They're all in the same boat together. We're all sinners seeking God's grace, but the key the key is always the attitude of repentance. So now we come back to the whole discussion we had in the church discipline thing. What's the key there? Repentance. It's always the issue. If there's penitence, we're cool. If there's impenitence, we have a problem. And that's the problem with so much of the literature coming out of the gay community is they're not repentant. It's the last thing they are. They want everybody to em embrace and, and uphold their new chosen lifestyle. It's not an issue of repentance at all. And so that, that's the critical thing we're always looking for. So I think his conclusion then on page 213 to 14, his summary position sums everything up beautifully. In view of the considerable uncertainty surrounding the scientific and experiential evidence, in view of our culture's persistent, present swirling confusion about gender roles, in view of our propensity for self-deception, I think a prudent 
and necessary to let the univocal testimony of Scripture and the Christian tradition order the life of the church on this painfully controversial matter. We must affirm that the New T tells us the truth about ourselves as sinners and as God's sexual creatures. <coughs> Marriage between man and woman is the normative form for human, human sexual fulfillment, and homosexuality is one among many tragic signs that we are a broken people alienated from God's loving purpose. Exactly. So then the church as a community of disciples comes together and lives faithfully before God without a judgmental attitude, without a holier-than-thou self-righteousness, but one that embraces all of us within that community. And that's the last um, two full, oh, the la there's three paragraphs at the end, the first of the three. Gary wrote urgently of the imperatives of discipleship. Are homosexuals to be excluded from the community of faith? Certainly not. But anyone who joins such a community should know that there, that is a place of transformation, of discipline, of learning, and not merely a place to be comforted or indulged. Amen. About every sin. You see, you don't just welcome sinners in because, well, we welcome everybody. God loves them all. And then say, great, here you are. Just stay the way you are. No. See, this is the problem with this whole, you know, and I'll just name names, it's the whole UCC mentality. You know, you're all welcome here. Well, of course everybody's welcome. But then, are you supposed to stay the same? Of course not. We are transformed. So it's the woman taking in, in adultery and the apocryphal story in John 8. So go and sin no more. Not go and sin all you want because you're forgiven by me. It's okay. You're fine the way you are. Don't sweat it. No, you're different. Quit, knock it off. Quit doing your stuff. Do it right. So in the penultimate paragraph. In the midst of a culture that worships self-gratification, a church that preaches a false Jesus who panders to our desires, those who seek the narrow way of obedience have a powerful word to speak. Just as Paul saw in pagan homosexuality a symbol of hum human fallenness, so I saw conversely in Gary, as I have seen in other homosexual friends and colleagues, a symbol of God's power made perfect in weakness. Amen to that. All right, final thoughts or questions about any practicalities on this whole thing? Yeah. Matt. This is a good answer, um, but I have also struggled with whether it's the great answer. I think, like, coming down like, it's time for a life of celibacy. Uh, what do we do beyond that? Because I, I think that like Paul says in 1 Corinthians that he who, he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Not that sin that sin is worse, but it's different. Mm -hmm. I think in a great way, like uh, a life uh, where you're constantly battling this, it's not that you're any more sinful than anybody else, but this mm -hmm. is a different sort of struggle with repentance right. than anything else. So how do we come alongside those people? You see, this is one of those things where you're going you're gonna to deal with the situation with the person and you're going to figure out how do we help? Does, do I get them involved in a Bible study? Do I meet with them one-on-one? -on -one? Do I um, you know, meet with them outside of the more normal pastoral things and start, you know, have a breakfast with this guy or something and build, develop a friendship and accountability that way? You figure out whatever it's going to take or maybe you find someone else in the congregation more appropriately you know, in a position to help them or if it's a gal, you just convert her and marry her. Um, but you... you you are going to just simply minister if to this person already. Yeah, assuming that you're you're going to um because we're within the toxis here, you're you're going to bring that person the full counsel of God's word the best way you can, and you're going to continually remind them of this. So if they come to you and say, "Man, I messed up and I fell again," say, "Man, I hate to hear that. It's horrible." And what are we going to do about this? And you start building accountability. You start figuring things out. So you have always kind of two things. You give them grace when there's repentance, but then on the and I get the vertical thing squared away again, but then on the horizontal plane, now how are we going to live more faithfully when the horizontal responsibilities you have? Let's set up a plan. Let's figure things out. And if you're getting in and over your head, you send them to a counselor who can help, and you just keep on giving them the tools they need to start living faithfully. Um, this becomes one of the more frustrating realities of pastoral ministry. And I didn't have the situation of a, a guy who was struggling with sex, homosexuality, but I had... Um, a guy with, you know, oh, probably more than one, alcoholic stuff, you know, where he'd come in all broken and repentant because his wife caught him with his beer bottle and he was all embarrassed and, you know, so, oh, I got to change. And so we talk about that and I give him great, you know, absolution. And okay, okay, okay. And I think, yeah, right. And eight, ten weeks later, he's back. He's back. Same story, same story. And this starts happening again and again and again. And 70 times 7 starts to seem a little more real. And that's when it gets hard because as a human, you wanted to say, forget you. You're just a lion. Turk, you know, you know, a lion guy here, and this is not good. So I, I have nothing to do with this. And instead, you got to say, 
I'm, I'm your pastor. I'll give you God's grace. Let's get this figured out. And you keep on working and you don't let him go. And you try to come up with better avenues, better things. And it's going to be the same with the homosexual guy who wants to do it right. And you keep on challenging him to, let's do this right then. What's this going to look like? All right? Yeah. Um, we're talking about order before mm-hmm. um, and understanding like the importance of marriage. So I'm, maybe this is stepping into P territory, but like thinking about... Kind of all this is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know, I know your, your deal with that stuff. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I'm just thinking like as far as counseling and teaching right now, we're kind of talking about like, yeah, it's a struggle. Like you'll just have to be celibate. But like how is that teaching then to, hey, there's an order here and there's something that God... Well, yeah, I mean, you can tell them there, God has given you a body for a reason and, you're, and you, have, you have feelings for a reason. Let's figure out if we can reorder them. That's where you start working on the trans, you know, transformation kind of a thing. And, and they rethink things and, they can maybe, and you can maybe bring some counselors in who can help and seek them out and do some research and find some people who can actually help him and help him figure things out. So, yeah, you, it, celibacy is what you do because you're going to be faithful today, but tomorrow maybe we can find a better answer. So let's keep on looking for that. And we, and we look for all that God has. And the possibility of you know, you know, getting married and having a, a wife and children, who says that can't happen? And who says I have to have wild, passionate feelings? Not necessarily. And you know, I mean, that's part of it too. We, we have such this romanticized view of everything. We forget, it. sometimes you just be obedient to what God told you to do. He said, go get a wife, go get a wife. Who cares if you love her, just marry her. <laughs> And then learn to love her. I mean, seriously, this is another whole topic. But Deciding what problems you're going to pick, right? Yeah, it's what's it's fascinating is you know in in India where they still have arranged marriages, they have a far lower divorce rate than we do because their attitude is different. You just you make it happen. You're not looking for the romantic oh, angel singing every day. You just make it happen. You grind it out. So you do. And so why what's wrong with that? We don't need to romanticize everything so much, Adam. What does uh repentance and reconciliation look like in the church this side of uh, the eschaton with those who've gone through uh, gender transformation surgery? Well, I see this is things are getting so complicated now and it's getting more and more messy. So it's kind of like in the guy who comes in and says, I'm on my fourth wife and I realize now that I sinned when I got rid of my first three. So I think I'm going to need to divorce this one and go back and marry the first one. <laughs> no, no. You know, and so, you know, what are you going to tell? What are you going to tell Bruce Jenner if he comes in your office and says, you know, I've been reading Luther and I think he's right. <laughs> and um, and I've, I realize I've made a Trumpets mistake. will sound at that point. Yeah, I, I've, made, I've made a mistake somewhere along the way. And the film crew's outside. Come in, you know, can they come in? You know, <laughs> so, you know, so the first answer is no, the film crew can't come in. Let's just talk. Um, but then, you know, what do you tell them? And this, this gets so complicated. Because then you probably say, well, let's sit down with your doctor and talk about what this means and figure things out. You know, what can we do? What can't we do? And just, you know, it's just it just gets so bizarrely messed up. And you're, you're going to encounter this stuff all the time. And I can't possibly anticipate every situation you're going to face. Trust me, guys, you're going to have people in your office telling you the most bizarre situations in life. And you're going to think, how in the world did you get in this mess? And and they're going to say they're going to say to you something like, what's the right thing to do, pastor? And you know the answer is, well, the right thing should have been done 20 years ago. But that's all water over the dam now. And at this point, there probably is no right thing. So now we just have to deal with the mess. And we figure out how to deal with the mess the most appropriate way possible. But right was given up a long time ago. Now it's just a matter of making the, making the most of a mess. And I think you can be up front with people and tell them that. You know, we make a mess of things. But God's grace is remarkable. And he takes our messes and does remarkable things. Let's just trust him to work some grace out of this. And let's figure out the best way possible we can go forward with this situation and, and figure it out. Obviously, you're going to be celibate. Obviously, you're going to want to learn to conform to what God's purposes are for you. And then together, let's discern what that is. And let's go forward. And I, you know, I can't tell you much more than that. Because you're going to have to figure it out when the time comes. But that's why you're getting your extensive theological training. So you're ready. You're ready. And if you really are having a hard time, just send an email to Gibbs or something. <laughs> Not to me. You can send one to me too. I'll just forward it. Nicholas. It seems to me that such issues we get a new understand, maybe a new understanding of what it means that there's joy in heaven more about one sinner who is repentant than about 99 righteous people because I think we all, all know about at least 99 righteous people in our church. Yeah. 
And you know, you're right. And the repentance is remarkable. And you guys are going to get your, your, the joys will come. And when they come, man, celebrate them, guys. Celebrate them for all they're worth because you're going to have heartache enough to make up for it. And I, I don't mean to be a downer. I'm just telling you like it is, guys. Um, the pastoral ministry is just rife with hurts and disappointments. And uh, it's, it's, it's so well said. The best thing about pastoral ministry is the people. And the worst thing about pastoral ministry is the people. And it's not people just making life difficult for you. What, what hurts the most, at least for me, is people who just do stupid, stupid things and bring hell on themselves. Oh, man. It's the woman who comes into your office and says, I'm thinking about getting married to this guy. Is it okay? And she's on just to be number four marriage. And she tells you about this guy. And he's some loser who she picked up in some bar somewhere. And she's ready to get married. And you look at her and say, don't marry him. It'd be a huge mistake. Don't do it. Okay, Pastor, really? I shouldn't? No, you shouldn't. Okay. And six weeks later, Pastor, I got married. It's not going very well. It's just, it's just what are you doing? Ah. And that's the heartbreaking thing. And you're going to deal with this stuff, guys, all the time. All the time. And the more you can invest in your people, the more you can deal with it. So when you have somebody who comes along and says, awesome, God's grace, I'm going to live in it. Man, rejoice. Celebrate. The one, one out of 99, it's, it's pretty cool. All right. Anything else on this? Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. I don't care where you are. Oh, I'm going to South Dakota. I don't have to worry about this. <laughs> it's going to follow you everywhere, guys. There is nowhere where you'll be able to dodge this. It's everywhere. All right. Good. Next topic. Had you read the essay published by the Senate back in 2012, now buried in some about 18 clicks through their website. I think it's still there somewhere on the Senate's website. What's that? Must mean it's worth reading. That's probably the way it goes. Or it's messed up. So, yeah, it could be really messed up. All right, so stewardship, a theological perspective. What'd you think? Yes. Can you write this? Yes. yes. <laughs> how'd you figure that out? I was taking a shot, seeing how you bounce, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any clues about that one? Yeah, Vingren, yeah. Well, I'm not the only one who reads Vingren around here, but... <laughs> All right, yes, indeed, I wrote this. And I wrote this at the behest of um, then stewardship guy, um, Nolhoff, who was stewardship for the Senate, and he knew me from Webster, so he had me put this together, which was actually kind of fun to do. But um, so, and I don't usually like making you read stuff I write, but this helps cut through a lot of junk. So any thoughts on this, on what's going on here and the moves I'm making and why and the significance of this? Yeah, James. I didn't know you wrote it. Okay, yeah, so I'm not stuck it up. That's fine. But I, I did like how it was, you know, I've always thought of stewardship as way more, too often it's about the money. Right. And what I really appreciated was, it's not about, it's about God gives us everything we have. Right. And, you know, he asks us to, to care for it. And we are responsible in, for what we do with in that. Steward. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I just... It was a refreshing, I mean, I think at the very end there was something about, oh yeah, the money is part of it. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was kind of waiting for the, yeah. waiting for that to happen. Five pounds of treasure. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Really, uh, Okay, good. And uh, I think often that uh, um, stewardship campaigns sort of come off as like this kind of car salesman sort of mentality, and you're always just trying to sell something to somebody, <laughs> and it never goes well. I just thought this was helpful to um, maybe it's more helpful to actually say no you are you are obliged to actually care all right about this is the this is where I think the big aha I want you guys to get from this and I'm hoping it comes through so I'm glad you picked up on that because that's a big part of what I'm trying to get done here JD when, at the beginning what do they have to do with each other well I think what you're establishing and what you've been establishing is there's an order there's like you're there's something to be said about what you're supposed to be doing that right. God has set up, right. whether that's to do with your gender or right. just living or vocation. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. Josh. On Vicarage, we went through, uh, probably some or most of us went through like seven lessons on stewardship or something. Mm. And uh, it, it always struck me that that part of it was trying to redefine stewardship as a holistic thing like mm. this, just, you know, conformity to God's will. And, uh, but it always then focused on money. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which was just interesting. It's like, that's right. why we have this stewardship emphasis here that we're talking right. about it, because people need to give money. And well, that's where it's the bait and switch kind of 
yeah, disingenuous it's, thing. Yeah. yeah. So. Now, I agree with that. All right. Now, one of the things that's going on in this essay, what I'm, what I'm trying to hit, obviously, what I'm driving with this thing is that we need to rethink how we, how we approach stewardship. And clearly, in case you didn't pick up on this, I'm trying to cast stewardship in the, raw, in the, in the light of two kinds of righteousness. Do you kind of notice that? So, yeah, it'd be a good book thought, yeah. So, the question is, is stewardship about vertical righteousness or horizontal righteousness? Well, yeah, and that's where I get in that towards the end of the essay when I use the um, kind of what page seven when I rip off um, Luther, you know, and I have a life of Christian stewardship has nothing to do with the Christian's relationship with God, and then the second point, a life of Christian stewardship has everything to do with the Christian's relationship with God, and obviously I'm stealing Luther's Freedom of the Christian Man, where he says, you know, Christian life, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. Next paragraph, or next sentence, a Christian is a perfectly dutiful slave of all, subject to all. So which one is it? <laughs> exactly. So, in one sense, stewardship is all about my relationship to God. It's all about me recognizing what God has given me and my willing obedience to what he has put me here to do. But that's the, kind of the key part of this is the idea of the obedience to what he has given me to do. So he has given me things, and it's his will that I'm fulfilling because it's his purposes for me. So I want to fulfill those purposes because that's pleasing to him. Okay? Oh, I can put this there too. So, so our listeners at home know what I'm talking about. Here we go. Available on the Synod's website if you look really hard. <clears throat> All right. So the idea here then is simply the fact that before God, yes, I'm his creature. But he's given me things to do, and the things he's given me to do are essentially his law. And the law always plays out in the horizontal realm. So you could do the same thing with vocation. And vocation and stewardship just all are running on the same rails here. You should be recognizing this. So who gives me my vocation? God. Does God care that I, how I live my vocation? Yes. Is my vocation done for God? No. Who am I doing my vocations for? Everybody around me. The neighbor is the target, not God. See, that's the point also. So, I have a responsibility to serve my neighbor, the fellow creatures around me. That's the target. So my vocations and all of my gifts are all part of my responsibility, coram mundo, in this world. They've got nothing to do with my relationship with God. All right? Now, the aha that I'm trying to get across is this. Typically, when we have approached stewardship, and this is since I, since I was a little kid, my first memory of stewardship was this campaign in the 70s called His Love, Our Response. And this great graphic. Mike remembers this. And um, it was these hands reaching down and these hands reaching up. His Love, Our Response. And it was this big, sin-and-wide push. And, she, and that just encapsulates the whole standard stewardship account. God just loves us, and we just respond. And so what you get is the standard Lutheran pitch is... Stewardship is gratitude, 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 gratitude. And you just got to gospel them into this. And so you tell them all about what God has done for you, and then you just say, now, what do you feel like doing? Everybody feel like giving God lots of money? Good! We're all set. And that's how we approach it. Isn't it also like, God doesn't need your money? Yeah, oh, you'll get that too. God doesn't need your money, but you want to give it. Well, not really, Pastor. And so this, this reminds me of one of my favorite parish stories. I had a guy come into my office, and this was when we were doing a kind of a leaning on people, and I would, you know, talk to people about what they needed to do, what their responsibilities were. He came into my office and said, Pastor, I want to talk to you. I said, okay, great. So I found a Bible verse. It says that God doesn't want me to tithe. I said, really? Show me. So it says here in the Bible, God loves a cheerful giver. I said, yes, he does. Well, guess what? I can't be cheerful giving a tithe. And so God obviously doesn't want me to tithe. And and see, his, his logic was impeccable because he's functioning from pure law gospel reductionism. I have to be motivated by the gospel, and I'm not, so therefore I don't have to do anything. And I just don't feel like being motivated by the gospel, so it hasn't happened yet, so I'm, I'm off the hook. And I said, well, that'd be gr you know, it'd be great if you felt like giving, but guess what? In the meantime, you got to do it anyway. So I told him. I said, now wait a minute. That sounds like the law. Because it is. That's the whole point. You see, quorum mundo. Does this dude have a responsibility to use his gifts to serve the people around him? Yes, he does. 
Do your parishioners in your church, do they have a responsibility to use their gifts to serve the people around them? Yes, they do. Do they have a responsibility to support the congregation of which they're a part and which they're a member of? Do they have a responsibility to support it with their money? Yes, they do. They do. It's an obligation. You can use that word. And so this gets to what Andy was saying. I've gotten to the point now when I preach stewardship stuff, and it's easier when you're a visiting pastor, but I would do it as a parish pastor now too, is you get in the pulpit and say, okay, it's, t- it's time for us to meet, meet our budget. And let's be honest here. God doesn't need our money. God, God doesn't ask for your money. Who needs it is us, the church. We've got lights to keep on. We've got ministries we we're trying to do. We've got people we want to try to actually go and visit. We need money to do this. And if you're not giving anything, you're slack on what God has called you to do. You must give. Now, anybody want to have a discussion about that? I say, no, so I'm expecting you to give. And if you aren't giving, guess what? <laughs> yeah, you're sinning. Because is it God's will for you to support and give to the church? Of course. And if you refuse, what do we call it? Sin. So, Pastor, you tell me it's a sin not to give? Yes, I am. So just keep passing the plate or what? Well, I know churches will do that. So this is the approach I'll take. Now, and I made a promise to a parishioner a few years ago, and so I always have to do this. I said, talk about tithing. I said, okay. So what about the tithe? What about this? And we pussyfoot around this thing all the time. And to me, it's just kind of clear cut. In the Old Testament, was there any discussion? What do you give to God? Ten. Done. All right. So in the New Testament, that's been overturned, right? Where? When? When did Jesus say, oh, that 10% thing? Don't sweat it anymore. One's good enough. He says, give to God what is God's. And that's everything. So that's kind of a bummer. So, <laughs> so you see, now, and the, the, the thing is this. I think we can establish clearly. God's will and purpose for the people in the Old Testament was 10%. Now, I know the world is different for them. They're not paying exorbitant federal taxes and exorbitant state taxes. But most of you aren't either because you're not in those kinds of tax brackets. And the reality is that the 10% they gave to the priests was not the only tax the Israelites paid. In fact, if you start doing some research, you start adding things up. They paid quite a bit. There were other things they had to give and other things they did and other, other things to give money to. So it's not like that was their only thing. So what I, the approach I've taken is this, simply this. If God has made it clear that 10% is his desire for what Christians should give for the sake of his church, I think that's a good place to start. And that's what we should be doing. Now, if you're in a situation where simply you can't make ends meet, you're going to starve your kids to do it, don't do that, obviously. But is that something you should be striving for? Yeah. Yeah. And the reason, I kind of put it this way, 10% is big enough that you miss it, but it's not impossible. And I think that's the whole point. Because, you know, it's the same way, maybe the first time you discovered your parents were tithing and you saw your mom and your dad writing the check for the church, you look, holy cats, it's a lot of money. You know, I can remember, you know, I can remember what are you doing? You know, that's a lot of money. Well, yeah, that's what we do. And, and that's the whole point. And the, and the cool thing is when you get into the habit of tithing, you don't think about it. It's just what you do. And guys, if you're not there yet, get there. Come on, get there. And I'll just read the riot act to you right now, law time. If you're not tithing, start. You just got to. Because if you're not, you're not going to ever be able to talk about this in the parish. Never. And you're going to cheat your people. And, I, you know, you can all the stuff about, oh, God blesses you when you tithe. I, mean, I believe all that stuff, but that's not even the point. Not even the point. The point is, this is just what you do. It's just the right thing to do. So, in other words, is the law at work when it comes to stewardship? Of course it is. Now, should the gospel be driving us and motivating us? Clearly, that's a cool thing. And does the gospel do that? Of course it does. But it's not always the only thing. And sometimes, frankly, it's not the main thing. And my ace for this is what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. And I talked about that in the essay too, kind of briefly, but that's a killer. You spend some time actually walking through that, it blows you away. I did this with a stewardship gathering once with a bunch of Lutheran guys. And I said, okay, so how does Paul motivate people? Gospel. Okay, let's look at it. So we walked through 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. I said, okay, let's read these verses. So he says, you know, don't let those Macedonian Christians show you up. Is that law or gospel? Well, it's law. Okay, now he says, make sure that, remember, what goes around comes around, and you're giving because they don't have much right now. The day might come when you're on the other side of it, you don't have very much. So is that law or gospel? That's law. Okay, then he says, um, you know, I've been talking about how great you guys are. Don't embarrass me. 
when I come, I would hate to be ashamed of what you actually have to offer. You know, don't give me a little pittance offering. Make sure it's a whopper, okay? It's not law or gospel. Come on, guys. Paul is just law, law, law. In fact, this God offering matters so much to Paul, he's not going to leave it to chance. He's not going to say something as inane as, remember how much Jesus loves you, and then do what you feel like. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. So why do we? We are so stupid about how we do this, frankly. You know, we get in the pulpit, remember how much Jesus loves you. Now, think about it. And I don't want to tell you what to do, because that would be law, heaven forbid. And just, you know, I hope the gospel moves you. Okay, sit down and just pray hard. You know, come on. Just spell it out. Tell people what God expects of them and spell it out. What, what are we afraid of? It's completely consistent with our theology. It's completely consistent with the two kinds of righteousness. It's completely consistent with understanding quorum mundo responsibilities, and that's what's going on here. All right. Yeah, Adam. Um, back in the New Testament era, they, they only had the church to give to because we now have lots of parachurch ministries and even uh, people who have to raise their own support to do their work. Uh, yeah, yeah. Paying, whatever. Is that tied in? It should always go to your congregation, <coughs> and if anything else goes above and beyond, or... Uh, of that tithe, you can give some of the congregations. Yeah, I've, I've, I've read, and people often have the principle of the tithe belongs to your home congregation, other gifts or offerings above that, which is, I think, a decent principle, but I can't find scripture to back it up 100%. I, I've, I've tried. And um, so I don't, I don't think you can necessarily pull that off. Um, and I've heard that stated. I think there is still this sense of, you know, the church is here, this is the congregation for me, this is where I give to this work that needs to be done. And so I think that still is the primary place. Um, and I would say for most Christians, that's a good rule of thumb. The only exception I would have is I know some people who are exceedingly wealthy who get quite concerned if they actually would tie to their home congregation, it would kind of screw up the budget. And um, because no one else, you know, and just kind of, like, you know, everything would be out of whack. So they're a little more judicious. And so they give a little less to their home congregation and other stuff, other places, but they still get to their tithe. And I can I can see that, frankly, because I don't think there is a rule that says 10% must be your home congregation. I, I just can't find that in Scripture, even though I've looked and tried to make that case. And I think you'd have to really stretch to pull that off. But um, I, I, so I would, that's maybe my answer to that, I guess. Yeah, Tony. But by the way, I would say, though, too, though, if your congregation is, you know, like tight and hurting, and you're saying, well, I'm giving my offering other places, you're, you're shirking your responsibility where it needs to be. You need to start there. Okay, Tony. Don't think me sneaky for asking this. Yeah. I, I've heard this from someone else, but... Uh, I've heard that there are some pastors coming out of seminary that say that until my student loans are paid off, that that's going to be where my tithe goes. Yeah, see, I don't think that would, that wasn't holding water at all. Um, cause he, I, you could probably justify it by, well, this is God's work that I'm doing, and I took my loans out to do God's work, and you know, I'm, I'm not too convinced of that, I guess. Um, you know, th there are countless stories you can start trotting out to you. Know, the evangelicals are famous for this, and I'm not so keen on this. But, I mean, the, the, real, the reality is when you live according to God's taxes, things tend to work better. They just do. And there's something about that whole, you know, the Malachi thing that, you know, if you don't give God his 10%, he'll get it in another way. And I've seen that play out. And I've seen it in the lives of other people. I've seen it, you know, just being kind of a reality. So th the truth is God, God does certainly care for us. And so I would say... You know, just see what God does. Go for it. Tithe, pay off your loans, see what happens. Give God a shot, see what he does. And we try to outthink God because, well, it's not reasonable. And then just, you're basically, kind of like I said before, you're short-circuiting what the Holy Spirit might actually accomplish. And this sounds a little bit like a schwermer I hear, I suppose, because, you know, what's enthusiasm, what God's going to do. But, you know, God does stuff, so why not? Let's just let him do it. All right, other questions or comments? Yeah, Josh. There was an interesting church council meeting at Victory Tour. They were discussing whether or not to, to allow uh, tithes by credit card or mm. just by card. And, and there was the fear that, like, you know, swiping a card doesn't carry the same kind of, you know, if it's a response, and can you really, what? you know, That's motivated it. by the gospel, swipe a card, you know, that kind of thing. And, and it might also be just a, perfunctory. Also, a fear that you're encouraging, you know, those young people who mismanage their, their money and rack up debt, just encouraging them to add that on the card. Ah. That's interesting. Yeah, see, I, and I know other congregations that are just all gung-ho on getting direct deposits set up and everything else because it's, you know, steady income. Um, I guess see, this gets, my response would be kind of be, if it's a habit, great. You know, when people do something, it's habitual, but it's a habit that is a right one, it's a holy habit, I'm all in 
I'm all into that. I mean, that's, that's what my book's all about. Holy habits are good things. And so if someone does something without thinking and it's the right thing, fine. And if they stop and think about it, everything will be good. But if they just get in the habit of just cranking it out, out and, you know, automatic withdrawal, fine. I don't have a problem with that. They're also afraid of that, that the young people who can't, you know, who rack up debt and stuff yeah. are just going to be racking up debt with their tithes. And oh, yeah, yeah. Like, well, yeah, let's sure. Have, let's have them do that <laughs> and then teach them to, you know, really fix their funds. Like, yeah, yeah, right. Matt. We're talking a lot about the tithe, but I'm kind of curious, you know, extending that into like, just our vocations in general, like not just as churchmen, right, but as, you know, neighbors. You know, right. The radical generosity that Jesus calls us to. Right. How do we, you know, speak the same, same law? You know? Well, yeah, I mean, this, we, have, we are creatures in this world. We have a responsibility to those around us. And so, the old, you know, time, talent, treasures, sure, that's, that's right. So you've got your time, you've got abilities, and you need to be using those for those around you. It's a generosity, it's a care for others. It's helping out the neighbor who's got a, a problem. But you have to be careful here, too, because the, the sense of vocation is always grounded in immediate responsibilities. And if you're always helping the neighbor and your own family is getting the short end of the stick, that's not right. And I had a few guys I would counsel that. Their wives would be like, man, he's helping everybody else. Mr. Helpful. Everybody loves him. But at home, we're kind of hurting because he's always out helping everybody else. And I've, I've known several guys who fall in that category. They, yeah, they find their identity in helping everybody else, and they kind of let their home fires burn low. That's not right. So you got to get some balance there too. So, you know, investing in your wife and your kids, that is right. It's not cheating up from other people. And then as you're able, you also invest in other people. But you got to be careful in keeping those balances. So that's good. Um, one last thought for you on this. I think it's really cool. Um, I give credit not to myself, but somebody else gave me this. So God doesn't want your time, talents, and treasures. What God wants is only one thing from you. What God wants from you are your sins. That's all God wants. He doesn't care about your time, your talents, your treasures. He doesn't need any of that stuff. Your neighbor does. All God wants from you are your trespasses, if you want to go with the T's. He just wants your trespasses. He wants you to come and say, here's where I sinned today. I'm good. I've got some grace for you. That's what God gives. That's what God wants. And I think that's a nice balance on this whole thing. So it's not like God's up there waiting for the stuff we have to give. He's not. But your neighbor is, and you have a responsibility. So don't be afraid to get up and tell your people, let's live the way God called us to live. And does God want us to tithe? I think he does. So let's go for it. And, man, what a transformation that could bring to a lot of congregations, just to hear that simple, straightforward kind of language, because they're not used to hearing it. And I think it's completely scripturally, confessionally sound. It's, it's rock solid. And that's what I was trying to establish in this essay. Some legs for you to stand on if you take this position. Because if you try it, you just might get a little pushback from somewhere. So remember the essay. All right. Anything else? Good. Stay on track. Keep with the reading. It's been a blast. Enjoy the day. <laughs>